my view of astrology is that it works through the fact that everything is connected, you know, that everything comes to this hermetic, you know, or Taoist. Everything comes from the one, everything continues to be connected, and therefore when we see the spiritual cycles or the cycles of the, of the, of the planets and the stars, that reflects an underlying spiritual cycle that is also controlling what's happening on things on Earth. So if you see those planetary cycles, we can predict what's happening, you know, and the, and the corresponding things in your, in your life. Welcome to the Cosmic Keys Podcast. This is going to be your episode for the week of January 25th, 2021 to January 31st, 2021. And on today's show, I have a great conversation with Christopher Warnock, who is a Renaissance astrologer, author, and pretty much revivalist of this traditional form of astrology um, that you can find on his website, renaissanceastrology.com. Renaissanceastrology.com is a site that I've been visiting several times over the years. I've recognized it. It's the first thing that comes up on Google when you search for the Orphic hymns of certain planets. And it's just a site that I've been on throughout my astrological journey. And I kind of discovered Christopher through his YouTube videos and immediately just wanted to book him. And after having this great conversation with Chris, I kind of realized that he's kind of a big deal in the world of astrology. And um, it's it was a really great conversation that I'm excited to share. I've been holding on to it for over a month now, so it's about time that it gets out. Um, but yeah, head to renaissanceastrology.com. If you're looking to book a reading or um, you can order talismans, there's just tons of resources on there. And it's kind of a classic site that has lots of great information for free. And it, it was a great conversation where the two of us talked about traditional astrology, um, kind of the worldview that is required to practice astrology and you're you're all going to love it. So if you want to skip forward straight to the interview with Christopher, I always put the sh- uh, the timestamps in the show notes of the episode. Um, this is going to be a longer intro because this is a significant week in astrology. And I've got some personal anecdotes I'd like to share to kind of show how astrology works in real life sometimes. So you may be able to tell from kind of the hoarseness of my voice or the frogginess of my voice, I've been a little under the weather. I actually came down with the COVID last week. And funny enough, um, it coincided with a transit to my chart. So I have a lot of placements in the fixed signs. Um, My ascendant is at seven degrees Scorpio. Um, Pluto is at seven degrees Scorpio. Moon is at 10 degrees Scorpio. Sun is at 10 degrees Leo. And last week, there was a lot of activity right around that area of my chart. There was the Mars-Uranus conjunction that happened at 6 degrees of Taurus. Then the Jupiter-Mars square happened the day after that. So basically, right when all that stuff started happening, I started feeling sick. And there was a lot of, um, you know, this was a Uranus transit to my chart and a Mars transit to my chart and a Jupiter transit to my chart. And the way that those three planets hit me was by me coming down with COVID. And interestingly, you know, from the perspective of Mars, it was a very sort of angsty sickness. Like as I was trying to rest and as I was trying to chill out, there were a lot of things triggering me. (laughs) Like every work email would make my blood boil. There was like things happening 
while I was trying to just get better from this COVID and my symptoms were like my lungs felt like I smoked like five packs of cigarettes. Um, and usually when I'm sick, I just pass out and I'm just like a vegetable. But this time around with this COVID, you know, it gives you kind of like a burning, um, dry sensation in your lungs and in your nose and everything. And, um, I wasn't that tired. It was hard to just fall asleep and veg out. I was kind of like feeling that uranus angstiness. Um, so I, you know, I was trying to rest as much as possible, but I, I was kind of hyper or not, not hyper, but just, uh, wide awake. And I saw that as an, uh, manifestation of the Uranus energy, the Mars square Jupiter energy. Um, but you know, this time of the year, when you look at the astrology, the fixed signs are certainly being activated and the fixed signs are certainly being activated this week as well. Um, lots of planets are in Aquarius at the moment and, the only uh, traditional planet that's not there right now is Mars and Venus and Venus will get there. I'm sorry. Well, also the moon, but you know, Saturn, Jupiter, the sun and Mercury are all in Aquarius right now. And me being a very fixed sign chart. Um, it was funny how that played out. Um, so I'm going to get into the astrology of this week. This is, week we're looking at the week of January 25th to the 31st I wrote out what I'm going to be talking about because I still don't have my Llewellyn astrological calendar that makes it so easy for me to go over these things so I had to kind of use time passages and cast charts tweak the times and kind of write everything out that's happening right now So we're coming off, like I said last week, was inauguration week. On Wednesday was that Mars-Uranus conjunction at 6 degrees Taurus. Then on Thursday, Mars moved to 7 degrees Taurus and squared off with Jupiter at 7 degrees Aquarius, which was that T-square to my ascendant. And also kind of like a grand fixed cross if you count my sun, but anyways... Um, also this past Saturday, we had the sun Saturn conjunction, um, in Aquarius. So this week, um, is another fixed sign week where the fixed signs are being activated. One other thing, when I was looking at the chart of this week, um, if anybody has anything in their chart at 19 degrees of, the mutable signs. So that's Virgo, Pisces, Gemini, and Sagittarius. Um, that that's also being activated because the nodes are currently at 19 degrees of Gemini and Sag and Neptune is at 19 degrees of Pisces. So that's causing a T square. So if you have anything at 19 degrees Virgo, that's really being activated. I thought I would just throw that in because I haven't heard a lot of people talking about that, that the nodes are um, forming a T-square with Neptune at the moment. Um, but let's get into the astrology of this week. We're entering, and I'm a little out of breath because I still have the COVID. Um, so Monday, um, the moon enters Cancer in the afternoon. Um the sun is going to be squaring Uranus on Monday as well at six degrees of Aquarius. So um, Uranus is staying put right around, or not staying put, but slowly moving forward at six degrees Taurus. And the sun is squaring off now with Uranus there. So, you know, Uranus is a disruptor and oftentimes an upgrader. So as I keep bringing this astrology back to myself to use as examples, even though it sucks to get COVID, I am trying to treat this Uranus transit as an upgrade. So I actually get 
basically a 10 day paid vacation when I test positive for COVID and can't work. And now that I'm kind of coming back to normal somewhat, um, I'm trying to use this as an upgrade myself. So I'm, I actually, um, applied for a bunch of new jobs and I'm trying to like really upgrade and make moves. So, you know, Monday yourself, your sense of identity represented by the sun is going to get that shock. It's going to get that disruption. So right off the bat, this is a really active week. Even it was, it was an active week last week and it's continuing to be active. So think about the themes of Uranus going into the beginning of the week. And as things get shaken up, try to embrace and try to upgrade Um, moon, like I said, is in cancer at the beginning of the week. So that's a good place for the moon to be on moon, moon day, Monday. Um, as we move into the week, everything is kind of building up to Thursday's full moon in Leo, which will also activate my chart. So if anybody's like me that has anything between like six and and 11 degrees of the fixed signs something's happening to you right now i hope it's not covid like in my case but um it's just really interesting how this stuff plays out um when you have a chart that's so heavy in the fixed signs like i do um so yeah the moon will move move through cancer in the beginning of the week monday and tuesday and then on wednesday Uh, Wednesday later in the day towards like 10 p.m. Eastern time, the moon will enter Leo, which is where all this activity is going to be taking place on Thursday. So Thursday, not only do we have this big full moon in Leo, but um, Thursday is also the sun Jupiter Kazemi, which is happening at the same time as the full moon. The full moon is the sun and moon opposition, but Jupiter is going to be conjunct the sun at nine degrees Aquarius at this point in time. Um, So we have the full moon in Leo, the Jupiter sun Kazemi, and then also the um, Venus Pluto conjunction happening at 25 degrees of Capricorn. So, Let's start with that, with the uh, Venus-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn. Um, You know, Pluto's been hanging out in Capricorn for a while. It was a key player in the 2020 astro action. Um, And Venus, you know, being the planet of relationships and love, is going to be blending with that Plutonic energy. So Venus Venus Pluto aspects often um, can be very lustful um, because, you know, Pluto representing the deep, dark underground of your psyche where, (laughs) where lust can exist, you know, that that's a thing. Um, But also Venus Pluto can be very obsessive about partners or about love interests, you know, Um, but on a positive note, you know, in the elevated point of view, Venus, Pluto can transform things about your relationship. So, um, that's happening at 25 degrees of Capricorn, the, uh, the full moon that's happening at nine degrees of Leo, uh, the, the moon itself is at nine degrees Leo. And then the sun with it's Kazemi to Jupiter is at nine degrees Aquarius. So that's happening. You know, the sun Jupiter Kazemi is kind of in a pop astrology t- phrasing can be called the luckiest day of the year. Um, I remember, I mean, side note, I remember the sun Jupiter Kazemi in Sagittarius was very auspicious and, the luckiest day of the year back in 2019 or 2018, whenever that happened. Uh, but this is, you know, the sun Jupiter Kazemi happening at nine degrees Aquarius, uh, 
with the full moon happening at the same time. And that, you know, the sun plus Jupiter at nine degrees Aquarius opposite the moon at nine degrees Leo, that's forming a straight line. And then forming a T-square to both of them is Mars at 10 degrees of Taurus. So, I mean, we have like this positive side of the full moon where Jupiter is here to help. Jupiter is your friend. Jupiter is expansion and good luck and good fortune and wisdom and philosophy. Um, but Mars is the malefic aggressor um, over at at 10 degrees of Taurus where he's been for the past couple weeks. So um, think about, you know, this full moon being kind of a climactic event um, happening in, in these fixed signs. And then Mars in the way that Mars does, you know, is going to add aggression to it all. And, we're talking about fixed sign energy right now. So fixed signs are very um, set in their ways, slow to change, slow to get things started, but steady once they kind of are moving. So that's all happening on Thursday. And, you know, both with, with the three things I mentioned with the Jupiter sun, Kazemi with the Venus, Pluto conjunction and with this full moon that makes a T square to Mars, they're all slowly building up, um, throughout the beginning of the week. So, um, Thursday is definitely going to be that climax that we're talking about. Um, and then late as we move later into the week, this is all that all happened on Thursday. So Friday, um, the, the moon continues to move through Leo and then late Friday, early Saturday enters Virgo. And then also on Saturday, um, another thing to keep in mind throughout this entire week is Mercury will be stationing retrograde at the end degrees of Aquarius at 26 degrees Aquarius. So you know the drill. Mercury retrograde is happening in Aquarius this season um, it's going to be a part of the big Aquarian pileup that happens in February. Um, once Venus moves in, that's going to bring all the traditional planets other than Mars into Aquarius. So it's literally big time Aquarian energy this Aquarius season. And if you don't, if you can't wrap your, your mind around that, um, Mercury retrograde is going to rewind and return and conjunct all those planets and square with Mars twice. Uh, so you will, you will know what Aquarius means by the time this retrograde is totally through. So it's going to be an interesting February for sure. Um, you know, the, the great conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter took place at zero degrees Aquarius and everybody made a big deal about that. So we're going to get to think about those themes again in February. Um, so yeah, that does it for the astrology this week. I kind of just wanted to make it longer to throw in my COVID anecdotes and yeah, I'm feeling a lot better than I did on the first three days, but even just trying to do this forecast, I'm like really realizing I'm out of breath, which is not chill, but that's COVID for you. So anyways, stay tuned guys. Um, my interview coming up with Christopher Warnock is not one to miss. So stay tuned and enjoy.
So today on the Cosmic Keys podcast, I'm speaking with Christopher Warnock, who is an astrologer who focuses mainly on Renaissance astrology and more traditional astrology. And in our pre-show chat, I was telling him, I've been on his website several times because every time I Google the um, the Orphic hymns for one of the seven traditional planets, his website, Renaissance Astrology, is usually the, the top result. So definitely check out uh, the Renaissance Astrology website, which is just renaissanceastrology.com. That's where you can book readings with Chris. And also there's a lot of other information on there, which, like I said, I've used as well. So I'm really excited today to chat about traditional astrology and Renaissance astrology and all the nitty gritty about that. So welcome to Cosmic Keys, Chris. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming. And I kind of wanted to um, start off by getting a little bit of your background and your bio. So tell us about um, what your early life was like and then it, whether or not there was kind of a religious or spiritual upbringing for you. And then how did you get into astrology in, initially? Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. You know, I grew up in a uh, suburb in the Midwest. So I had the completely a spiritual background. You know, it's funny. I took this, um, Kat Ironwood has this hoodoo class and she said, you know, get one family tradition of, you know, something like, you know, horseshoes or anything. I had zero, absolutely nothing. It was completely plastic, you know, uh, mall kind of upbringing. So where, I had I a just, long, where in the Midwest are you from? Um, I was born in Wisconsin and I saw a, I would, you know, middle school all the way to high school was, uh, in Michigan. Okay, nice. So, I'm I'm originally from Illinois, so yeah, and I live in Iowa now, so it's all you know. I've got this whole Midwestern thing going on, mm-hmm. um, and um, so um, so it was a long journey for me. I mean, I think that you know when I first started, for some reason, I, you know, I went to college, I went to law school, then I was in Washington D.C. Then for some reason, sort of spontaneously, when I was in Washington D.C., I started, I became a seeker. You know, in a seeker, you sort of, it's sort of like this, you know, nowadays we have this incredible sort of buffet, you know, like smorgasbord of like 10,000 different things you can kind of sample, you know? And so you do, you do that. That's when you're a seeker, you sort of look around and look into things. So, um, you know, one of the first things I got into was Sufism. So there was a, 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 an Iranian Shiite Sufi order that had, uh, uh, well, they, their meeting house is called a Hanaha in Washington, D.C. So I went to that. I was initiated in that. And that was really interesting. And, um, but there was a lot of polit- internal political stuff, and I couldn't speak Arabic or Farsi or whatever. So there was only so far I could go with that. So that kind of petered out. Um, and then probably the next thing I got into heavily was Zen. And that I, I, I I, we moved into Iowa eventually. And so I was doing this pretty heavy Zen practice and, um, and that again, I only got so far with it. Um, and then finally I had another teacher who was into modern, the modern non-dual tradition. And, and that was, that worked, um, as far as that. So I had the initial, what's called the Kensho experience. And so that was, which is the experience of no self. So that was very useful. I think that's probably what you, in that particular tradition, it's sort of like a black belt. Black belt is like your GED, right? If you don't have, you know, it's, it's, it's an achievement, but it's only the beginning of the, you know, of, of doing that. But it's, it's still something to be, it's, it's very useful. You need, to, you need to have that Ken show, that no self. So I would sort of describe myself now as I still have sort of a sentimental attachment to the Sufism, but I'm not practicing it. But I would say right now I'm, I'm, pretty heavily Buddhist, um, which is a kind of funky combination with this Western, you know, Renaissance astrology. But it's interesting because in, in the Japanese Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, they already have a lot of astrological magic kind of in there. So it's part of the whole tradition. Um, and they deal with, um, you know, astrological spirits or divas or whatever. So it, it fits in really nicely with that. So, um, as part of the spiritual seeking, I kind of stumbled across astrology. And when I first started looking into it, I was looking at modern astrology. And so that's one thing that people need to realize is that 
it's it's if you if you go to say someone to someone you say what kind of astrology do they do and say astrology astrology it's like saying what kind of cooking do you do it's like what kind of cooking 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 you know tacos enchiladas you know like oh you mean tex-mex no cooking you know it's like you think that person really didn't know what they were talking about but in fact astrology there's a lot of different types of astrology and most people are doing what's called modern astrology which is kind of had been developed in the probably since about 1900 and the focus in modern astrology is on looking at your birth chart and then you a lot a lot of times it's a very psychological approach which is very valid i mean i like to do i have as part of my readings i do psychological readings and i think it's very effective so it's really good for that um the there's older types of western astrology for example the medieval renaissance is the school that i practice in and that was very focused on prediction. And then there's also Hellenistic astrology, um, which is the Greeks and Romans. So that's another school. And then you have, you know, Indian astrology, the Vedic astrology, you've got Chinese Tibetan astrology. Um, and so these are all different schools of, of astrology. And um, so the medieval Renaissance, uh, like I said, I like because it's very um, predictive. So it's a, a lot more complex in terms of the technique and then it is also a lot more precise uh, and it has a lot of uh, accuracy in terms of concrete stuff, but it's not as good at psychological. So for example, if someone came to me and said, will I marry this particular person? Then I would say, yeah, let's do a horary question, which is a type of astrology where you, you do the chart of the question rather than the birth charts. But if then you said, why don't we get along or why, you know, what, how, then I'd say, okay, you need to look at your natal charts. And I actually have a reading that does both. It does called the, um, complete relationship reading and it does a horary which says okay whether you're going to add the relationship or not and then it compares your natal charts and that's really interesting it's really fascinating to see how people's interactions you know the positives and negatives what pulls them together what drives them apart but that really doesn't tell you whether they're going to have a relationship or not it's kind of it's interesting how you know that's very useful so it's what what that really allows you to do is look at it from different perspectives and so that's what's kind of fun about doing astrology or any kind of esoteric thing right now is there's so much stuff going on. It's really exciting. We really have kind of a full toolkit and lots of different perspectives to look from. So I think that that's one of the things that's great about being an astrologer now. So, um, so I think that's sort of a, you know, a brief, you know, a little bit about my background and a little bit about the type of astrology that I, that I practice. So yeah, it's it's really cool that you kind of started off with Sufism and then, you know, got into Zen and kind of these more non-Western mystical traditions and then got into astrology and everything like that because I think that's kind of a common theme where people, because it, it actually like a like the type of Eastern mysticism or like Eastern meditation practices have been kind of popular for a while at least with like in my case it was like yoga and stuff like that you know that's a little bit mainstream but then if if you get into that type of practice or whatever that's more eastern i feel like the symbolism in astrology and hermetics is sort of the western version of that in a way or it brings you kind of to the same place but through the symbolism of your own culture so I find I find it interesting when people kind of end up at a, in in like Western astrology via some kind of Eastern tradition like that. It's funny because see the problem in the West is that we let all our esoteric traditions die out. You know, what I mean, there's not living Hermetic masters who have a, a lineage that goes back. I mean, we essentially had, for example, astrological magic. You know, I essentially revived it. You know, about 20 years ago, I had studied. Um, horary astrology, which is like I said, it's looking at uh, uh, charts of questions. And the sort of mirror of horary astrology is what's called electional astrology. Electional astrology is choosing times that are auspicious to do things. So for example, if you want to get married, what's a good time to get married, you know, or you want to start a business or something. So I got interested in that. And then I realized that one of the things you could do with electional astrology was pick times to make talismans. And so I thought, oh, this is really exciting. So I looked around and no, none of my teachers wanted to get involved with it. I mean, they just like, this was like, oh no, it's mad. Astrologers don't really like to do magic. It's kind of funny, astrological magic, because it's a combination of astrology and magic. And so you have to, you have to have will, you want to do magic, you know, and have the, have the drive to do it, but then you only have to do it, you can only do it at a particular time. 
So that the, the magicians don't like that. And then um, the astrologers don't particularly like to do magic. So if you're an astrological ma magician, it's a little bit of a, you're a little bit of a, an unusual sort of person. It's a, it's a combination sort of thing. So, um, but I got interested in it and, you know, I realized, my gosh, we've got all these sources out here. We've got uh, Cornelius Agrippa, three books of occult philosophy. We've got Picatrix, which at that time hadn't been translated yet. It's like, wow, let's, let's actually do it. And so that's what I, you know, decided to do. See, because in order to make astrological talismans, you really need to have a good knowledge of traditional astrology. And, um, and then, you know, it was sort of a process of, of reconstruction. And, um, you know, so that's, that was very exciting to get involved with. And then Picatrix, which um, my first teacher, he didn't really teach me practical astrological magic, but he kind of got me oriented in terms of how to think about it was Robert Zoller. And um, he was the first, you know, it, it was in Latin. And so I remember asking him for a translation. He's like, well, you know, there's not really a translation yet. So I spent about, it was probably like 10 or 12 years trying to find somebody to work with me to translate it. And so then John Michael Greer, so he was, you know, a, a very noted, um, you know, uh, uh, esoteric author. He's uh, really big into Golden Dawn magic. He was the arch druid of this, you know, druid order. And so he translated probably about 75% of it. And I did the 25%. I did the astrological portions of it. And um, so Picatrix is probably the premier sort of grimoire of astrological magic. It was written about uh, 1000 AD in Arabic, in Arabic, Spain and Andalusia. And it, it's a compilation, really. It says it, the author said, I looked at over 200 books. And you can see, because there's a lot of stuff, you say, well, this book says this, and this book says this. And so it, it's an interesting book, because unlike a lot of grimoires, it's not just a recipe book. I mean, it does explain, you know, practically how to make talismans. There's a lot of philosophy in there, though, too, how, how it works. So that, that was very exciting. So we translated that, and that's helped kind of you know, kick it off. Also like the Renaissance Astrology website. I mean, my website I think has about 800 pages on it. So it's just absolutely huge. And there's a tremendous amount of information on that website. Um, plus we have talismans. So the actual making, having talismans available, making talismans, I teach courses, has really kind of, you know, sparked off this revival of this traditional astrological magic. And, um, you know, I'm kind of responsible for the infrastructure because I remember, you know, I look at, you look at stuff online beforehand and it'd be like magic talisman and like, well, how did you make this? Nation? You know, what's your source? No information, you know? And so what I kind of pioneered was the idea that, you know, for example, if you're going to make a sun talisman, you'd go to say Cornelius Agrippa, three books of occult philosophy or Picatrix, and you look it up and you see what that says. Now, a typical sun talisman would be from Picatrix, a book, uh, book two, chapter 10 has a lot of them. And the typical recipe goes something like this. You want to have the planet in its sign or exaltation or otherwise, you know, in a multiple uh, lesser dignities. You want to have it rising or culminating. You want to have the planetary hour of that planet. And then you want to have the planet unafflicted. And so those are factors that kind of maximize the strength of that particular planet. And, um, and so then what I would do is say, okay, here's the actual chart. You can see the chart and here's the factors that I used and here's the source. And so that was kind of, which nowadays I think pretty much everybody does, but that was one of my innovations as far as, you know, coming along with astrological magic. And, and, and I think it, again, it has something to do with my, my legal background um, because it just seemed logical to me to, because when you write up, for example, a legal brief, you have to cite to a source. You just don't make it up. You, know, you have to say, okay, this, is, this comes from this law, or this comes from the statute, or this comes from this particular source. Also in academic writing, it's the same way. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it gives a structure to it. So, so that, was, that was exciting. And it's interesting, you know, um, it, it does, I think it is important to, as you're talking about how these mystic traditions, if you're going to do magic, I think it's important to also be following some kind of spiritual path to keep yourself oriented. Um, mm -hmm. Because it is powerful. And I think it is important to use it. I'm very focused on doing positive stuff. I won't do anything negative, you know, malefic magic at all. Um, Cause I just, you know, it just, I think it's a bad idea any more than it would, would be in your day to day life to do stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the, um, with the books you were mentioning, like the Picatrix and um, Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy, those are, um, 
it, it is crazy. Like, so you were kind of you and you said John Michael Greer were mm-hmm. you translated that right the Picatrix. So, because I wasn't even aware of that. I've I've I don't have a copy of the Picatrix, but you know I've heard about it over the past recent years as just being out there, and I didn't really think of it as something that that was only recently translated like that. Um, but I have a copy of uh, three books of occult philosophy, and I'm going to be honest, I got through a couple hundred pages of book one, and I have the Llewellyn like hardcover copy that has a bunch of footnotes, and I was reading all the footnotes where it would kind of explain some weird thing that Agrippa was writing about, but I found that book uh, really interesting, but I couldn't get over at least in the first book when he's talking about <laughs> like um his ideas of like science i guess and it sounded really like you know like toad's blood and like raven's claws and stuff like that so that i'm not saying that threw me off but that was interesting but are most of the more talismanic or magical things kind of in the later books than book 1 for that one yeah i mean the Three Books of Occult Philosophy is much more organized than Picatrix. I mean, because mm-hmm. Agrippa, he he said, I'm going to write, essentially write an encyclopedia. And so Three Books of Occult Philosophy, what that corresponds to are the, is his sort of philosophical view of, of reality, which is the three worlds. So you have the material world, the celestial world, and the divine world. And so these are all interpenetrating. They're sort of at different levels you can interact with. So it's sort of like different interfaces, right? So you like mm-hmm. a serial port. You know what I mean? Your USB port, you know, different ways. So what I'm doing is sort of plugging in at that celestial level, right? And mm-hmm. so whereas a Kabbalah, for example, is a divine level. You know, you're, you're dealing with the, you know, the, the world of ideas, the world of archetypes directly or angelic stuff. Um, whereas the celestial is sort of the intermediate. And the material is sort of like the material world. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there that, you know, you'd be like, well, you know, I don't really buy into that stuff. And I you know, it's just one of those things. It's like, there is, um, you know, whereas modern people were used to a certain style of presentation, you know, and, you know, stuff that's kind of crazy for that for objectively crazy, but if it fits our style of presentation, we're like, Oh, we're fine with it. You know, there's a lot of, you think about science. It's like, it's funny because, you know, there's only one right answer, but they keep changing it. Like is cholesterol good for you or not? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like constantly changing their mind about it, you know, and it's, it's funny because science is supposed to be so objective and everything, but it's like they seem to be having a lot of arguments about stuff, you know, and, um, and the thing I'd say about science is that, you know, it's, it's true and it's for objective phenomena like, you know, water does indeed freeze at zero Celsius and boil at 100, right? But in my life, that's probably not the most important thing that's going on. And so, what science does is to look at all the material things that happen exactly the same way for every single person who does it. Right. And that's Mm -hmm. what science is. It has to be objectively verifiable. So, but you know, you talk about most of your life doesn't work that way. You know, it's sort of like, you know, if I'm a matchmaker, for example, it's like, well, that's kind of psychological, isn't it? You know, or like, like even a psychologist or historian, I mean, history isn't a science, but that's not to say it's not true. It's not true. So it's a very small type of reality. And so what's happened too is that, you know, the, the, what they call the quote, I would say quote enlightenment is essentially around 1700, there was a, a movement that said, you know what, we're going to destroy any kind of spirituality. It's all garbage. It's superstition. It's bullshit. We're not going to go with that. We're going to be atheistic materialism is the way to go because there's nothing really exists except matter and energy. And, and the spiritual stuff, it doesn't really exist. And so that's been, you know, the, 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 what's behind a lot of this, this philosophy of science is this complete rejection of anything spiritual. And so um, they've basically been at war for that period. Now, what happens is that, you know, basically if you're a, a religious person, then you get to be religious on the weekends, but the rest of the day, you know, rest of the week, you essentially unconsciously are atheistic materialist. So that's how you, that's your view of reality. That's one of the things I start out with my courses. I talk about worldview. The worldview is really what's your, what's, what's your, not just your conscious philosophy, but what are your unconscious assumptions about reality? And so one of the problems with modern sort of spirituality and modern magic and stuff is that 
that even though they're like, yeah, you know, I'm into all this magical stuff, unconsciously, their views tend to be atheistic materialism. So, for example, astrology, how does it work, right? I mean, you ask a modern astrologer and they're going to say something like sunspots or gravity or, or they'll say synchronicity and synchronicity. Well, the young, he says synchronicity is a causal connecting principle. In other words, he's like, I don't know how it works, you know, mm-hmm. whereas the reality is astrology is spiritual. My view of astrology is that it works through the fact that everything is connected, you know, that everything comes to this hermetic, you know, or Taoist. Everything comes from the one. Everything continues to be connected. And therefore, when we see the spiritual cycles or the cycles of the, of the, of the planets and the stars, that reflects an underlying spiritual cycle that is also controlling what's happening on things on Earth. So if you see those planetary cycles, we can predict what's happening, you know, and the, and the corresponding things in your, in your life. So, but, you know, there's no scientific causality there. There's no sunspots or energy beams or rays or anything like that. It's, it's spiritual. And... Um, so that's one of the reasons I was really drawn to traditional astrology was that it had a coherent philosophy that, that explained it and it made sense. And whereas modern, you just, it, you know, you basically have to like, you, it's not scientific. So if it's not scientific, it's irrational. So we're just basically, we don't have any way of understanding what's going on. And um, you kind of layer this sort of new age stuff over the top of the, you know, the materialistic atheistic philosophy and it just doesn't work very well. Um, and it's interesting because if you go back to before 1700, the scientists and the theologians weren't, you know, weren't in argument with each other. I mean, Albertus Magnus, who's a very well-known, um, at the time they call natural philosopher, um, he wrote a book um, called De Mineralibus, which has got a bunch of talismans in it. And, you know, he's like, no, no, you know, if he's asking about spirituality, he would have said, well, it's like asking a biologist about chemistry. I'm like, do you do chemistry? And like, well, you know, no, but it's part of what we do. That's what he would say about like looking at stones. He's like, well, of course we have to acknowledge the spiritual. We're not directly looking at them, but the spiritual is part of everything we do. So at that point, the the the, the schema of knowledge hadn't splintered yet. Whereas nowadays we're like splintered. You know, that's the whole thing about the, you know, the moderns is that they have this split sort of personality, and you know, the whole mind body thing. You know, that's a modern split. The whole spirituality, you know, um, science thing is modern. You know, it's. Uh, it's that King Crimson album, 20, 20th century schizoid, man. I mean, that's when we have a schizoid, schizoid society. And, um, but, you know, that's how we're able to have internet. You know, we were able to, to break, by breaking that, you know, um, wholeness, we're able to focus on technology. And that's, but that's also why we're so messed up, why we have climate change and everything too, um, because we've lost our balance. Um, so, um, so that's what I would say is that, you know, for me, the, I like the, to be able to do traditional astrology and do predictions. The magical stuff is fun, but ultimately the, the what was really useful about doing this was, for example, I've probably done about 5,000 horary questions for clients. You do 5,000 horary questions. It's not always correct, but you know, it's amazing how often the horary will nail the situation. It's like you, after a while, you're like, you know what? There is, there is a spiritual connection of all things. This stuff really does work. And then once you do that, you're like, you know what, all this modern, you know, the atheistic materialism, that's just not adequate as an explanation of reality, you know, and there's, there's something beyond that. And, and that's what I would say, you know, the, the spiritual path stuff is important too, because that's, that's what and I've ended up being pointed into. And, um, you know, that's ultimately what I want to focus on is, you know, I want to be enlightened, you know, or in other words, I don't want to be me anymore. You know, I want to have that continual experience of no self. Um, and, um, you know, as I get older, you know, I, I still, you know, I, I, and again, I don't poo-poo the be able to predict or be able to have results with the talismans, but I think more and more, it's not the, that's not the ultimate purpose for me of, of what I'm doing. Um, and it all points towards it. These are really astrology, magic, are really practical applications of this spiritual understanding of reality. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I loved everything you were just saying. And um, when you were talking about the worldviews and how we kind of unconsciously have this modern materialist worldview, atheistic worldview, I totally agree with that. And I'm struck. I feel like I'm extremely woo woo and extremely open to whatever. But I lately, even I find this like automatic skepticism that I'm, and I'm just like, where does that come from? Like, why do I just, and I, and I see it in the people around me. I'm like, well, it's probably this 
the world we live in. Um, but in terms of the actual worldview, I'm really interested in the the Renaissance version of the world that you use with the work you do. And I'm the thing I'm curious about is, you know, how the Renaissance and the medieval period were extremely Christian periods. So where does like the, the God of the Bible, where does like the Christian things blend with, with this version of astrology? Like how well, all do the, all the, all the traditional astrologers, like if, for example, if you look at Cornelius Agrippa or for example, Marsilio Ficino, Marsilio Ficino is a priest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He wrote a book called three books on life that has all this really cool astrological, it's more of a health, astrological health manual, but it also has talismans and stuff in it. I mean, he translated the, um, the Corpus Hermeticum for, uh, you know, the Medici. Um, and he was helped set off the Renaissance, you know, he was, you know, Botticelli and, you know, he's working directly with those guys. And so here's the thing is that m- the modern Christianity, right. Is fundamentalist. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, it's really interesting because if you, this is, again, this is my view. If you look at, like I was talking about the enlightenment, essentially what you've got is this war. It's a cold war between science and religion, because what, what happened was essentially people, there's a truce. And so if you're religious, you're allowed to believe in God. Right. But then the rest of your views are atheistic materialistic. So it's very compartmentalized. So it's like, if you, again, I think they've done studies where they ask, you know, Americans, do they believe in God? Because Yeah. They believe in God. It's like, they don't act like they believe in God, right? Everything else is all athe- atheistic materialist. So that's like atheists get, you know, there's not a lot of atheists, but they get upset because they're like, this is ridiculous. Everybody knows there's no God. Well, yeah, everybody does, except everyone still believes in God. So they rationally know there's no God, yet they still believe in God, right? And um, so that's, you know, there's a lot of, because nobody can look, you can't look at the stuff. It's a blind spot for people. And, um, but the modern, modern Christianity is very stripped down. I'm not to say that there wasn't these sort of fundamentalist views at the time. So essentially, like, for example, fundamentalist is like the Bible's literally true. Like, it's like if you took a videotape of the crucifixion, you'd see exactly what's in the Gospels. That's right there, right? As opposed to the view that, you know, truth isn't necessarily, like, for example, like, you know, um, like a made for TV movie. I mean, they kind of, it's more of an archetype than the, the true reality never follows the archetype perfectly. You know what I mean? And so it's mm-hmm. like, like it's like as seen on TV. Um, I guess well, let me put that a little bit better. It's like, um, I think that, um, so it gets back to fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is, is, is a very limited view of reality and it's actually has a lot of modern, you know, they, they, they buy into the modern worldview. Right. And so it's like the whole creationism thing. Right. I don't see any problem with evolution. Right. Because it seems to me that's it's, it's what you've got is the one manifest as the many, and then the many move towards the one, you know, and I just don't see any problem with evolution from a spiritual standpoint. But what I, what I have a problem with is the idea that it's, it's random and purposeless. Right. Cause it mm-hmm. seems like, you know, you've got um, the incredible amount of diversity and, and cre- look at the beauty that's created through evolution. You know, think of a hawk, right? I mean, it's incredible. Or I have my, I have a, my cat, you know, he's in cat, cats are incredible. You know, it's like absolute and in, in amazing beauty that's created by this evolutionary process. And that doesn't seem like just randomly sticking things together. It seems like there's some purpose behind it. And you, as you look at evolution, you know, there's an increasing amount of complexity, right? Increasing amount of, for example, like moving in the level of intelligence or, you know, sophistication and everything like that. And that, again, doesn't seem to me like a random process. It seems like there's a purpose behind that. But you can't, that's, that's heresy. If you go to a scientist and say it's purposeful, they're like, oh, no, that's, it's just, it's random. We believe it's, you know, we have to, as an article of faith, basically believe in random, randomness, you know. Because that's, that's what atheic, atheic materialism really is, is nihilism right? There's mm-hmm. actually nothing. I mean, that's what we really believe in is nothing. And you live and you suffer for no purpose and it's pointless and it's just, we all just die. That's, that's nihilism, you know? And that's really what the atheistic materialism pushes you towards. And, um, you know, my, like I said, my experience of reality, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying because I was really gripped by it for a long time. 
And by doing this astrology and magic long enough, you know, and by just be, trying to be as open-minded as possible about reality. I mean, the worldview I live in now is full of spirits, you know, it really is. And it's like, it's a, a lot like a Shinto, the, the Japanese, the Kami, it's like everything has a spirit, you know, and not, not mm-hmm. even just living beings, but you know, like, like we, I have like a big rock in my yard and, and the Japanese, I have a, what's called a Shiminawa, which is this rope. And you put, you, in Shinto, you put a rope around anything that's sort of, not, not to say every, everything isn't sacred, but special stuff. So this rock, this is like where the spirit of my, my yard or my neighborhood lives, you know, and it's like, that's, you know, that's real to me. And, um, you know, I think that that's people's, oh, that's crazy. But I'm like, this is the reality that I have, that I, and I like my reality, (laughs) you know, it's a lot nicer than nihilism, you know? And, um, so that's, you know, I think that that, but it takes a long time. I mean, that's, this is the, 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 the atheistic materialism is the ocean that we swim around in and it takes a lot of work, um, to, to, uh, to have another worldview, but it's possible. I mean, it's unusual. I mean, most societies, I mean, the Renaissance and medieval worldview, it has its, you know, it has a Christian quality to it, but it has a lot more in common with every other traditional society because it mm-hmm. has that spiritual basis. It's the modern one. That's weird. That's, that's the aberrant one, you know? That's the one that's bizarre is that the, you know, because there were, for example, the um, Indians talk about the Charvakas, which are materialists, but that was just one school of philosophy in India and not, it didn't have that many people that were into it. Right. Whereas now basically everybody's atheist and materialist. And um, I mean, a lot of it is, look, you got the TV, plasma screen TV, you got the SUV, anything that produced a plasma screen TV and SUV must be great. Right. I mean, it's look at all this amazing technology, the philosophy that underlies that must be really great. And so when we have the inevitable crash, you know, because of climate change and because of industrial civilization, essentially, I know whether it falls apart quickly or slowly, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's over. Um, then I think that the, um, a lot of the attraction of atheism and materialism is going to fade away, you know, because I think that's really what a lot of what's really, and it's pushed by the elite, you know, it's, it's what we're kind of programmed with. So it's hard to, it's hard to go against your, the programming that you get when you're, when you're, um, you're young and, and what everybody else in the society is, is putting out there. I mean, look, like I said, look at me with the, with the attorney stuff, you know, it's like, I mean, I'm just no complaints and I'm getting harassed by the bar about it. And like, what, I mean, can I just do my own thing? It's like, no, that's, it's threatening to them. You know, I think that's ultimately what <laughs> problem is. It's scary. It scared them, you know? Yeah. It, it, it's funny too. It's, it's like, it's like the tradition. I mean, if you're if you're studying these things, I feel like there is an inherent like fear of of being the heretic, and it's proving that you still are the heretic in this world, just like you would have been, you know, further back in the past. Luckily, see nowadays the the beauty of it is we're in a nice stage because it's a, it's people like oh it's sort of entertainment. Astrology is sort of entertaining. You know, yeah. but it, it still is a crime in uh, the state of New York, for example. It's a felony. For practicing astrology? No, it's what's to, if you say it's real. Oh. <clears throat> See, if you practice it and say, if you, if you, if you, someone pays you and you say this is real, right, then it's, then it's, then it's a crime. And it's so bizarre. If you say this is fake, it's just for entertainment. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Because that's the real heresy, Right is trying to pretend it's real. I mean, they're not honest. They're not consciously thinking that, but it's interesting how that played itself out. Right. And um, because it was one of those stages, these, the statutes came from, you know, originally they would be freaking out about what, I mean, astrology was always kind of questionable because they were afraid it was having to do with demons or something. But then what they went to by the 18th century is to say, well, it's all fake. So anyone that says they're an astrologer is just, just fraudulent because it's all fake. And so that's where the New York statute, you know, it's a lot of those older statutes come from that is to say, well, someone who's pretending to tell fortunes when everybody knows you can't do that. Right. And so that's the, whereas again, if you say it's just for entertainment value at a circus or something, they're like, oh, that's cool. You know, that's, you can do that. But yeah. I mean, most people just get away with it, but the New York times has a thing about it. They have, they're kind of on the war path. Now there are people out there, these psychics, that will like say, oh, you got a curse on you. Give me a thousand dollars, or ten thousand, or a hundred thousand dollars, and I'll take it off of you. Which so it's a scam. So there's not, no question that there are scam artists out there. But um, that's one of the reasons. Like I do um, 
Hori questions for curses, but then I don't, I don't know how, I don't remove the curse. I mean, partly that's because I'm like, well, I don't, one, I don't know how to do it. Two, I don't have any interest either way. You know, if you come to me, it's not like I have a, a particular interest in saying you're cursed or not cursed. You know, I want to be, I want to be able to be, have an objective view of the circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. So, which is interesting because Hori questions for curses, I would say maybe 25 to a third of the time of the person is, you know, what that means with a curse is there's active malefic spiritual influence affecting you right now. So maybe 25 to 30% of the time. And a lot of the time with people, the curse is not a witch or somebody consciously doing it, but someone who's close to you emotionally, who's angry at you. Like, yeah. so for example, if your parents are mad at you or a boyfriend or girlfriend, or your husband or wife or sister or brother or something, if they're angry at you, then that can, if that has a negative spiritual effect on you. Kind of like so, the evil eye or something. Exactly. Well, that's a little different because what that is, and this is interesting because if you go back to England in the 16th, 17th century, when they had the, the, the sort of witch craze, um, the witches were people that had a natural spiritual connection to people. So again, they weren't doing spells. They would just ill wish you. So you, you know, the classic was the, the poor old woman would go to someone's door and knock on the door and say, you know, I'm, I'm poor. Will you help me out? And they're like, get out of here. And she said, oh, I hate you. I hope your cattle die. And then the cattle will die. And they're like, okay, she's a witch. Yeah. That kind of stuff. It's interesting too, because what legally what they did, Blackstone's commentary on the laws of England, he said, you know, he said, we don't doubt there's witches. This is like 18th century. But he said, you know what? The evidence is too difficult. We're not going to do it in court anymore, which I think is illogical. That's how I would approach it. Because it's just impossible to figure. I mean, I had somebody today calling me up and asking me about his talisman. He's like, oh, this terrible stuff happened. And I said, you know, who knows? what the causality with that is. I said, I don't think, I mean, I only do angelic stuff. I mean, when I'm dealing with the planets, it's only the angels of the planets, the most positive stuff. Um, so it's just really difficult to figure out the causality of what's going on with that. Well, now that you mentioned that, that's something I wanted to ask you about too, was um, what are, like, could you explain a little bit of how there are angels connected to the planets or demons even? Like, sure. How does that I mean, worldview work? It, it's very, I mean, it's pretty standard hermetic or even Christian, which is that, because see, here's the thing about it is that the modern view of religion is very influenced by Protestantism. And Protestantism, they kind of went in and said, we're going to throw out a lot of stuff. And, you know, so it kind of moves you towards atheism. You know, it's Catholicism, then, then Protestantism, then you become an atheist. It's sort of like this natural progression. And one of the things the Protestants do is to essentially throw out all the intermediate beings. And there's just you and God. And I've actually seen people say that. There's no spiritual being except God. No, that's true. I mean, there's a Sufi saying that says Every, everywhere you look is the face of God, right? But that's a really tripped out, you know, enlightened view. Whereas this is like there's no spiritual beings except God. So there's, that's it. And when I have a, an interaction with a spiritual being, it's with God. And I'm like, I don't think so. I think if you're interacting, it's not the ultimate power of the universe. You're interacting with some kind of intermediate kind of, you know, messenger type thing. Um, you wouldn't be able to comprehend or, I mean, it would blow you to destroy you if you're going to have, you know, how could you have the full, you know what I'm saying? If, yeah. if the total glory and power of God manifested to you, how could you even, how could you handle that? So, but anyhow, the standard view, whether you can look at her hermetic or, um, Christian is that there's a lot of intermediate spiritual beings. And so there are, um, now you think about, for example, angels, angel means angelos, which is from the Greek angelos, which means messenger. And they do stuff. They're like intermediate stuff. You know, for example, you know, um, in the Bible, you've got each country has an archangel, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's funny because I think of America, the archangel of America to me would look like the statue of Liberty. Right. Yeah, or like Colombia, like the Colombia. Yeah, goddess. exactly. Now, each country is going to have the dark side, though, too. Would have a demon, too, right? <laughs> and to me, the demon of America would probably be like the head of an eagle, and armor, and like you know, like those, you know, like the seal with dripping with blood, right? Mm -hmm. So all these, like this, really, like like I said, bird of prey, you know, and arrows and blood and you know, armor and stuff like that. You know, that's the dark side, right? So it's it's essentially a personification of these different qualities. Now, the modern view would be it's symbolic. I'm like, no, that's real. You know, there's that, that, you know, think of America, right? I mean, there's no America, right? There's just a bunch of stuff, right? But America's real. You know, there's a, it has a spiritual reality to it. 
right? I mean, we act as if it's we act as if it's real, and it, in fact, it is real, you know. But there's no physical. I mean, you, you go to the border, like I said, you go to the border between the United States and Mexico. There's no line there, right? But nevertheless, that's a reality. Um, so, um, Ficino talks about you know that one of the one of the concepts that, that is a, that's pretty much normal in, in medieval Renaissance thought is the great chain of being. Mm-hmm. So you go from the highest, from the one, all the way to the many. And there's these actual connected chains. So, for example, he says, you know, have a fixed star. Um, I think he uses Serpentarius. So, so fixed star, he's, I think he goes to Jupiter and Saturn are underneath the fixed star. And then you go to um, daemons, which are like intermediate spiritual beings. And then you have men that act like serpents, right, that have that quality about them. And then you have actual physical serpents. And then you have a stone, you have a plant that's like a serpent. And then you have a stone like a serpent. So these are all connected things. And so like the sun, um, sun, you know, like talk about planet. Have you heard of planetary rulership? So yeah, everything just like with the like domiciles and stuff. Well, no, but I'm talking about like every material thing is oh, ruled yeah, by like, a planet, mm-hmm, right? Like correspondences. Now, yeah. So, so for example, the sun rules roosters because they crow at dawn, right? It rules kings because the sun's like a king. It rules the heart. It rules yellow things like because they're you know the sun's yellow, right? It rules gold. Um, now everything has all seven planets, so it's all, it's a little complicated because it's you know you can't people argue about well the sun could also be you know gold could also be Jupiter because it's valuable or Saturn because it's heavy. It actually is multiple things, but you're looking at the like for example the rose. Rose is you think of a rose. The predominant quality of rose is it's beautiful and sweet smelling, which would be Venus right? Mm-hmm. It also has thorns, so it's ruled by Mars. It also has Mercury because of the sap. It also has roots, so it's Saturn. So everything has all seven planets, and you can talk about the rulership as what's the predominant quality of that thing. So that, you know, the, each planet, though, also has a soul, right? And, an, and they talk about an intelligence or an archangel. So you have the physical body of the planet, but then you have the, the, the spiritual body or the spiritual being, and so that's the, the interface that I prefer to act at is at that highest level, you know, the ar- archangelic level of the, of the planet. But you're also going to have sort of lesser beings and you're also going to have demons and stuff connected, you know, negative spirits connected with it too as well. And so it just depends. Like, for example, if you did a, a blood sacrifice, right? I mean, I won't do that because I'm a Buddhist, but you can imagine it would be powerful but you're not going to really draw the beings that I would want to be dealing with. That's more of a demonic kind of thing. You know, if you're killing something, I mean, there's a lot of power in death, but it's not the kind of power that I would want to be dealing with personally, you know, from a karmic standpoint or just from the, you know, it's, that's not a, that's not the kind of, that's what I would say is it's not, not wrong overall. It's just not what I'm drawn to. I mean, that's not what I, luckily my path has not pulled me towards that kind of stuff. You know? Well, yeah, I've, I've even heard um, if, Cause working with like grimoire stuff, like I've, I've just heard that the, um, the more demonic forces like work quote unquote better or just like are going to like blast you in the face with something. And then the angelic ones will be very subtle and like very like pleasantly synchronicity or something like that. Is that true in your experience? Think about this. Think about this as like, Probably the predominant form of modern magic, right, is psychological magic, Mm -hmm. right? So Donald Trump is an incredible mage of psychological psychological magic, right? I mean, he has incredible ability to, like, cause, you know, he's got great power because of that. And so the really – one of the buttons for that is fear, right? That is Mm -hmm. incredibly powerful short-term motivator of people, Right? But it's usually evil, right? When you're scaring people or frightening them, it's usually an evil sort of thing. And that's what I say about demons is that they promise a lot. Too. There's a, a famous, this is a fairly famous story. There's a guy, he's an internet magician, fairly well known. And um, he did a, and Goetic isn't exactly demonic, but they're kind of a little more rambunctious or moving in that direction. But anyhow, he did a invocation of a particular uh, Goetic spirit and he asked for a specific sum of money. And so, about a month later, his house burned down, and then he got a check for that specific sum of money. Was that Rufus Opus? Yeah, I think that's him. Yeah, I think I've heard him that tell story that story. Before. But that's what I'm saying. So it's like I didn't want to out him or whatever. But, I mean, that's, to me, classic 
more when you get more into the demonic stuff, right? Is that you can actually make a deal with them, right? And you know, you can ask for specific stuff, and you know, sometimes you know, and that's the thing. The promise, at least, is it's going to be quick and fast, and you get get gonna get whatever you want, right? Mm-hmm. The promise is they don't always keep the deal. It's that whole Mephistopheles thing of messing with you, right? You know, like eternal life, but you age and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Not that you can get eternal life from this stuff, but you know what I mean? That it's, whereas the, what I like about the angelic stuff is it's more like, you know, it's like prayer, right? Mm -hmm. You really don't have to worry about if you pray to St. Joseph or the Virgin Mary, that they're going to kick your butt, right? I mean, you really, you won't necessarily get what you ask for, but you don't have to worry about the blowback. Right. And that's what I like about the angelic stuff. And it does tend to be, it can be subtle. I mean, sometimes it's not subtle. I mean, I've had plenty of people. I mean, I have, if you go to my website and look at one of my thousand pages, I got a, a, a testimonial link there. I got like 70 pages of testimonials. And some people get like, oh, I got this, you know, not everybody, but you know, I got this big sum of money, you know, or whatever. I mean, there's some really obvious, you know, strong effects, um, but you can't count on it. Right. I mean, it's not like it's going to be a hundred percent. You're going to, you're going to get in whatever you want. And, um, I th- partly, you know, people will poo poo this, but I do think there's a level of the an- angels are looking out for you. Right. Yeah. And if you ask for stuff that's inappropriate, they're like, nah, we're not going to, we're not going to do that. But, uh, and other people, they're like, for somebody whose purpose in doing this is the stuff. Right. I mean, cause what they do is like, I tried to get it through conventional means and I failed. Right. And so this is like my last ditch effort. I'm going to do is magic, which I don't really believe in, but if it works, it's great. And if it doesn't work, then it's bullshit. And then I don't get immediately what I want. Oh, it's all bullshit. Whereas what's you're better off, at least with the stuff that I do is that, you know, for example, you know, today is Monday. Monday is, you know, the, the, the actual days of the week come from the planets. That's where the week comes from. So Monday is the moon day. So today I'm going to do a really short invocation of the moon. Um, and then tomorrow's Tuesday, which is Mars Day. I'll do the Mars. I've been doing that. Each planet, I'll invoke them, you know, for 15 years, right? So I have a very strong relationship with the planets, you know, and, and the celestial uh, celestial angels. And that's that has been beneficial as opposed to, okay, now I happen to want something. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to get it. And if I don't get it, it's, I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, it's, if you don't focus on the effects, you have better effects. It's a little yeah. paradoxical, you know what I mean? And um, so, so again, like I said, I don't poo-poo the effects. I think it's really useful, and I, I do pray. I mean, every day I'm asking for stuff. I'm like, let's be happy and healthy and safe. Um, I'm less focused on that as the be-all and end-all of what this is about, you know, and I'm a little more flexible and open to it. And, and like I said, the weird thing about that attitude is if you have that attitude, you get a better result. And people that, people that call me up and say, I want to win the lottery, I'm like, don't buy a talisman. Just forget mm-hmm. about it. I mean, it's like, this is not, it's not going to work. The other, the other thing that's funny about that is I forget who told, who told me this, but it was an, early on, this guy was a magician and he said, you know, he was able to talk to spirits and stuff. And he said this, he asked about the lottery and the spirits started laughing and said, come along. So they kind of did the astral body travel to the, the um, lottery building and it was covered with all this magic. You can, oh, can you imagine wow. how much, can you imagine how much magic people are doing to win the lottery. I yeah, mean, it's incredible. So it kind of cancels each other out. You know, this is like people that's funny, too, because people ask me, like, if, you, if they're sort of more blue collar or whatever, they'll ask me about lottery. If they're sort of like middle class, they'll ask me about the stock market. Like, oh, I had this great idea. You can do, use astrology to do the stock market. And I'm like, yeah, you're only the 10,000th person who's thought of that. It's like mm-hmm. it doesn't work very well. You know, and I think for me, I'm not able to do it. Um, and there's a couple things. One is that I think that for a horror question, when you ask a horror question to get the timing of the question right, it's something that really matters to you. So when people ask about relationships, that really matters to them, you know, or like, like, will I get this job or whatever? It's very important. When you're asking about the stock trade, you could really give it, you really don't care about the stock trade. I mean, you care about the money, right? But that particular trade, you could really care less about, you know? So I think that's a problem. Um, but it's just one of those things of like, it's not a get rich quick thing. I mean, the thing is, it's since the magic is real, it can't. Inst- it's not like Harry Potter. It's not going to instantly give you everything you want. How could it? It's real, right? What real thing instantly gives you whatever you want? 
you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the things about, it's a little hard. See, it's interesting because I'll get people that like, for example, have a family tradition. Like if they're African American, they have like a root work or hoodoo tradition in the family, right? So they're used to working with magic and they have a realistic idea of what you can do with it and what the effects are. And again, they have much better success than somebody who comes into this and their view is Harry Potter, right? And it's like, and they're kind of skeptical, but they'll, like I said, they'll try it in case it works. And, you know, after five minutes, you don't get exactly what they want. Oh, it's all garbage, you know? Yeah. And that's well, I was, pretty typical. I, I'm wondering, since you have like this uh, practice, which is based on, you know, texts from the Renaissance and Middle Ages, and it has a very distinct worldview, what are your thoughts on kind of like the chaos magic or like the, the really easy, quick stuff that's popular that you could just go on YouTube and like cast a spell, you know, with no well, spiritual background. Think about this is like, um, the chaos magic operates from your personal spiritual power, right? Mm-hmm. Which you do have, but you don't have, a, it's like the, you know, law of attraction stuff, right? I mean, that stuff does work, but what you're relying on is your own power, which is not that great. Astrological magic though, you're accessing directly the power of the planets, which you can imagine how immense that is, right? So it's a lot more powerful because you're going outside yourself. So a chaos magic certainly seems to me to be, a, you know, it can be effective, but it's like, it's somewhat limited because you're not, you're only accessing that, that, that power source of yourself. Um, but think about it too, quick and easy, you know, quick and easy is great marketing. You know what I mean? If I'm going to sell something, I want to sell it as being quick and easy, right? Because people like the idea of that. But quick and easy means, uh, you know, ineffective, you know. <laughs> it's, I mean, when, when in your life have you ever done something quick and easy that had amazing effects, right? It's pretty rare. I mean, well, normally yeah. to achieve anything, it takes a hell of a lot of work, you know. It's mm-hmm. tremendous amount. To have a great achievement, you need a tremendous amount of work, you know. And that's just the real. Again, it's real. I mean, just because something's magical doesn't mean it's completely taken out of the realm of reality, you know? And if, if magic was, you know, that, if that's the standard you're judging about, it's like, okay, I'm going to be the king of the universe if I do one little thing. It's like, well, that's completely unreasonable. Um, and so, I mean, a, a good example is like, you think of blackjack, right? Blackjack, if you're at a casino, a good casino with good odds, the, the casino only has a 1% or 1% or 2%, um, you know, uh, advantage on you, Right. If you count cards, you'll get a 1% or 2% advantage on them, and they'll throw you out for it, right? They'll throw you out. It's, you know, they won't want to have a 1% one, one or 2% advantage. And, or, like I said, a 1% or 2% advantage will lose all your money eventually. So if you said to people, I want to get a 1% or 2% edge, they like, forget it. It's not worth it. I'm like, that's really useful. So that's what I would say about the magical stuff is that it gives you an edge. Now, sometimes you can have spectacular results. It's not to say that you won't have it, but even a day in, day out, it's nice to have that edge. And if you're smart about it, right, you're like, that's worth it. You know, it's worth it to have that edge. It's worth it to be, have that additional power in my favor. And so, um, but, you know, like I said, it's like there's a lot of hype out there. And, you know, people, marketing, marketing is, that's, it's a type of magic. You know, it's psychological. Advertising is, advertising marketing is all psychological magic. And it's real easy to manipulate people. You just tell them what they want to hear. The problem is, when you don't follow through with it, then they get disappointed. So, and that's what I, I mean, I'm very adamant about that with my talismans, for example. I'm like, there's, you know, I have no idea what's going to happen. You know what I mean? There's no way mm-hmm. I can guarantee what the results are. And if that's a problem, don't buy it in the first place, you know? Um, and it's, you know, a lot of people have had really interesting, exciting results. And, um, but, you know, there's no way that anybody can guarantee. I, I see that occasionally with magical stuff. I'm like, how could you guarantee the result? It's a bit like a doctor saying, I'll guarantee to cure you. I mean, just because you're not cured by that doctor doesn't mean he's fake, right? But no doctor is going to be able to, to guarantee that you're going to 100% be cured, you know? So it's, that's what I would say. You know, it's, um, it works, but not all the time. Yeah, it's, it's interesting in my experience of doing kind of just ca- – I, I guess chaos magic, what what you were saying is kind of like you're using your own personal will or whatever, your own spiritual. Your own, yeah, you have, your own, you have power. Yeah. You know, you're, a spirit, I, you're a spiritual being too, you know? You wear these when bodies. You're, when you're talking about just um, really quick results with kind of like, uh, well, you were talking about it from like a demon point of view where they deliver, but there's a catch. And I've definitely had, 
bad experience where like like for example one time i i was kind of just making up and really putting like strong ang- kind of angry like uh addictive will into it and like and it was about getting this apartment and i was like going to the location i wanted and it was just like i need to move here blah 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 and it it came true like way too perfectly with all of this baggage like i was basically living with a really creepy like craigslist like makes you uncomfortable type of roommate and it was this crazy mixture of like it came so true but there was so much baggage attached to it and it really wasn't it it was a half success like it was half great because it was a it was a great location everything but there was so much like bad stuff surrounded by it so that it, that reminded classic, me though isn't it yeah I mean, it, it's way too like, classic it's just funny because it's like the thing about it is is that you know it's ultimately the serenity prayer you know it's like you know grab me the serenity accept the things i cannot change the courage to change the things i can and the wisdom to know the difference i mean that's all there is right because mm-hmm. if you're just totally passive and accepting everything that's not i mean that's a very standard western kind of view of what a, a saint is is you're a doormat right and everyone just walks all over you and you just put up with everything you know and it's like that's to me i don't i don't buy that but at the same time it's like you can't change everything you know it's Mm -hmm. like this is really but it's and this is the funny thing about for example the legal work that i do is like you know it's very i do a ton of pro bono stuff but what i do is i focus on like there's a whole universe of stuff that could be changed that would be good to do right and then there's like a, like a think about it as a Venn diagram. There's this, you know, a lot of stuff that could be done. And then there's a smaller arc of stuff that you can do. And so the interaction of that is like, what's, what can I actually accomplish? And so the legal work I've done is not like, oh, I need to go out. This is bad. I need to change it. I'm looked at and said, you know what, what can I actually do? You know, and that's what I'm really focused on is like, what can I actually in practical, you know, terms actually make a change and how, what can I actually accomplish? And um, it's getting that interchange between, can I really see reality really clearly such that I can, you know, and it's funny because I made an incredible change in my, I mean, it's weird, you know, as as an astrologer, I'm like the leading landlord tenant lawyer in my state, right? I've had five cases in the Iowa Supreme court on landlord tenant. I mean, I, I basically established the, a lot of the precedent that's followed in the area, you know? And I, I, to this day, I'm like, I have people calling me from all over the state asking me questions. And, um, you know, and I helped them out with it because I had this view of like, okay, this is an area that needed some, you know, needed to be, you know, some work and needed some precedent. We need to have some stuff done in it. And it worked. And, um, you know, that's, that's where the, that's what's useful about, you know, the, the magical stuff is that when you start following this and you recognize this, the spiritual reality of things, it starts to infuse your whole life. Right. And that wisdom and awareness is useful no matter what you're doing. If you're a bus driver, it's useful, you know, no matter what you're doing, the spiritual awareness is useful. And so it's interesting because our sources are kind of focused on, okay, make this talisman to get love or whatever. But again, like I said, that when you, when you penetrate into that, you're like, wait a second, this is real. There is a spiritual connection to all things. I mean, and the part of that, just the whole idea of karma, right? You know, it's like, I liked your story about the anger too, because I mean, recently I had a situation where I was really mad at the other lawyer in the case because he was being completely, he was, he was lying. He was making stuff up. He was claiming that there was a law that existed that was just lies. And I was so mad. And, um, and I, normally I'm very polite. And so I wrote this brief and I had to write it in a day because the guy was screwing around. So I had to do it really quickly. And it was just this concentrated blast of anger. And it's like, really, at the time, I kind of enjoyed it. But afterwards, it was kind of like, this is unpleasant. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like, being really angry is actually very unpleasant feeling. And on one one hand, it feels kind of good. But if you really penetrate deeply into it, you realize it's not a good. And that energy, I think it did propel me through, but it kind of left me feeling a little gross. And, um, you know, I, I said, it doesn't surprise me that if you're using that energy to accomplish stuff, it, it, it's very, you know what I mean? It's tied up with a lot of negativity. And so the, the spirit in which you act, you know, it, it does, 
you know, it does make a difference. You know, the, the, there's a, the karmic stuff is, um, there's a practical basis to karma. I mean, if you're nice to everybody you interact with, it's not, you're going to have nice interactions, you know, that's, that's makes sense. But just in terms of like, you know, what you do comes back to you, you know, it's good from a selfish standpoint. I'll do that too. I'm like, I don't really want to do this. I'm like, do I have to do this? I'm like, no, nah, that's the right thing. I should do this. You know, I still, to this day, I have that, have that going on. And, um, so one of the great things about doing astrology magic is that, like I said, it, it confirms for you that this stuff is real. You know, all the rest mm-hmm. of it is, is real. Now, um, again, you know, I think that part of the reason that the um, Eastern stuff is ex- interesting to people and accessible is because a lot of what you have, ex- I mean, in America is like fundamentalist Christianity. It's like, yuck. I mean, that doesn't have any appeal to me at all. Uh, it's interesting. I started going for a while to this Lutheran church near my house. And every time I take communion, because they let you take communion as long as you're baptized as a Christian, I would get really high. It was funny. It was like, <laughs> it was really interesting. It was made me, it really wasted me. And it was like, because it was the body and blood of Christ, you know, that, 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 even though it's, you know, this 2000 years and it's, you know, this church, you know, like this regular America Midwest church, the power was still there, you know, if you were open to it. Um, and so it's just that the Christian thing is not my thing really. I mean, I actually do have a prayer. I do Hail Marys. I think I like the Virgin Mary. So that's part of my prayer sequence every day. Um, but I understand why people have an, somewhat, some people have an aversion to the whole Christian thing because they've just been sort of scarred by it. Um, other people, it's very alive and very vital for them. And it certainly has a tradition of you can, you can do this a magic within a Christian tradition. I mean, all you have to do is just say, well, God made everything, right? And he made the angels, right? And if you want something, you know, like for the, if you want, if you want the, your trash picked up, you don't go to the mayor, you go to the department of public works. And I, you know, I need to have wisdom. So I go to, or whatever, I go to Jupiter, right. And I go to the angel of Jupiter. It's like, so that's, that it's, it's relatively easy to do that. It's, it's heterodox. I mean, most churches are not going to accept that, but it's certainly not, it's not like it doesn't fit into a Christian perspective. Um, as long as you're doing positive stuff, you know, because if you pray to angels, I mean, they, the, the Catholic Church, they say they venerate the angel. They don't worship the angel, but there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference. But, you mm-hmm. know, it's like what was not a whole heck of a lot of difference from praying to a saint and praying to the, you know, Jupiter for positive stuff. There really isn't. Well, yeah. And it even reminds me of like, um, like voodoo or San- Santeria, where they just swap the saints for their, their, uh, original gods and spirits and it's the same thing pretty much yeah i don't i'm not sure about that that's the sort of a new age thing of their everything equals everything else which i'm not sure i buy into that you know i think it's sort of like like if you try to translate a word from one language to another you never get an exact it's not it's, it's a separate system you know what i mean i think you yeah. had to respect you had to respect the system now that their thing was a little bit of a different thing because they had to do that as a way of protection Exactly. Yeah. I mean, allowed, it was covert. They weren't allowed to do it. Exactly. And so, you know, and I think that's, I think that there's some truth in that. It's just one of those things that I've had people be like, oh, well, Shango is Jupiter. So I'll just do a Jupiter. And I'm like, no, those are different. You know, that's, that's not respectful. I mean, I, I, the best example of that, another story is somebody did Yamoha, who's in, uh, you know, s- s- I know it's a century. It's the Yoruba religion or whatever. Yamoha is like a sea goddess. And so someone did a mansion of the moon talisman on her altar and it caught fire. Oh God. <laughs> Cause it was just, you know, but what I do is I have, I have like a, you know, um, bookshelves and I have little postcards. That's what I use for my images. And I have like this, a, a planetary altar that has seven planet images and they just, I put the candle right in front of the planet. I mean, they have, in the heavens, they have their own space, you know, and they have a little space in my altar. You know what I mean? So I just give them their own little space. You know, that's what I do for the, for the planets. But I have like, a zillion talismans. I have like 50 talismans, you know, I have a bunch of different altars and stuff. Um, they all interact. I mean, people are a little worried, like what about Mars and Venus? I'm like, no, they get along. At least of my <laughs> talismans they do. Um, so it's just one of those things of like, I think that it's an area that, I mean, it's exploding now. I mean, people are so interested in the stuff and what's cool about it is there's a lot of fluffy new age, you know, stuff, but there's also now a uh, space for people that take it seriously you know, and that's what I've always done. I mean, for me, the, what I wanted to do was to do, you know, astrology and astrological magic for sophisticated, intelligent people, you know, because there's always been the stuff for unsophisticated people, right? That never went away. 
but you know the you know people who went to grad school or that kind of level of person they stopped believing in this stuff about 1700 right whereas mm-hmm. now we're coming back to it i mean i i was reading a really interesting book about um it's it's, it's called kashmiri shaivism in a way but it's sort of this tantric you know medieval tantric um uh, practices by this guy. He'd gotten all his PhD and everything, but he was a practitioner. And so he said, you know, it's really important to be a practitioner. And I'm like, yeah. And that's one of the problems that I've had is that, see, the academic study of this is like, they just officially have to disbelieve in it. You know, it's a little weird. It's like, you're studying something that you think is just garbage. It's like, and people say, oh, well, you know, in his private life, he does this stuff. I'm like, but he can't publicly, you can't publicly come out and say that astrological magic works in an academic journal. It just wouldn't be permitted to do that. You know, it's taboo. And so yeah. that's a little weird. And it's funny, too, because they get a lot of prestige. I mean, people want to study about, oh, I want to learn about Picatrix, so I'll read an academic article. I'm like, that's fine from an academic perspective. But if you want to be a practitioner, I mean, that's what we, that's what we did our translation. We said, we want to do this for serious practitioners. We want to be as scholarly as we can. But the purpose is to practice. And it's a bit like my legal practice, because as a lawyer, what I need to do is I have a, a, a a practical problem in front of me, but if, and I need to solve that problem. I need to deal with the practical realities of the court or whatever I'm my clients or whatever I'm dealing with. At the same time, I need to know the theory, right? I need to be able to go into the, you know, do the research, understand the theory. So it's kind of both come together and that's kind of informed my astrologer practice too, because I'm very scholarly and that I know the sources, but the purpose of knowing the sources is to do the magic, right? It's not like to do a sociological study of why, why people would be crazy enough to believe in magic, which is for mm-hmm. a long time what they were doing, you know? And um, so it's just, cause again, they're captured by that whole atheistic materialism, you know, and whatever their private views are, they're not officially as an academic, you know, or part of that institutional structure. They can't say it's real, you know, that's just, cause it's not, you know, the, the, the yeah. view of reality. I mean, I got this from national Institute of science and they're like talking about, well, you know, it's how unfortunate is that people believe in pseudosciences like astrology because they're so superstitious. I mean, that's the official government view. You know, people don't like to hear that, but that's the reality is that you are on the margins if you're going to actually believe in this stuff um, and practice it. And that's another thing, belief. People ask me that, do you believe in this? I said, well, do you believe in atoms? And they'd be like, what? No, atoms exist. I said, well, you've never seen one. I mean, you take it on faith, right? I mean, it's just part of your worldview, right? Yeah. And I don't believe in God. Right. Or I don't believe in spirits. I mean, I have experienced them. You know, it's part of my experience. And so that's, um, I mean, I know, I know them, you know, as opposed to the belief is like, I believe in Santa Claus, you know, it's ridiculous, but you believe in it anyway. You know, and that's a way a lot of mm-hmm. the sort of modern Christian stuff or religious stuff is, is I know it makes no sense whatsoever because I'm an atheistic materialist unconsciously, but I still believe in it no matter what. It's a little crazy. So that's that whole schizoid thing. Yeah. Well, this conversation has got me thinking a lot about the ingrained worldview and me and you are reflecting on it. Like, yeah, I'm a skeptic for no reason sometimes because I'm brought up in this world and I have to live in this world where that is the norm. And I know, I don't, I just, I think people sub or unconsciously know the rules that in in academia and in anything professional, anything corporate, anything in the media, you have to sort of indirectly align with that atheist materialist materialist worldview. But I think it's like a social cue that people know they have, but I I just don't think people, most people are conscious of it. And I'm seeing it more in my client work too, of just like people that are like, both really skeptical of it and then really dependent and desperate to use it and to have it save them. And it's, it's making, it's making me think of my own situation too. Cause lately I'm like, I feel like I'm too skeptical and it's not coming from anywhere. I think it's, I'm just absorbing the world around me and it seems like your approach is a good one to take. Well, I think that, you know, the, if you, if, if you think about it, again, when, when students take my full courses, I, I, the first thing we start, we start off with is talking about worldview because I just think it's mm-hmm. really incredibly important to understand that. And, you know, it's – the other thing I say too is it's not like I'm saying this is right or this is wrong. But, you know, if you're watching Lord of the Rings, you don't get up in the middle of the movie and start shouting, there's no elves, there's no, there's no dwarves. You know, you just enter into it, mm-hmm. you know. 
And that's what I say to people about the traditional worldview. I'm like, because it's not easy. It really isn't. I mean, in a lot of ways, we are not individuals. We are a manifestation of that worldview. I mean, the worldview is living through us, you know? And so, oh, I'm going to have a different worldview. I mean, that you're stopped being you. You know what I mean? There's, that's, that's actually who you are to a great extent. So um, it's not easy to, to do that. And, you know, it's also just, if you just take all the obvious material stuff that's repeatable that you can see, and then you grab onto that as reality and you dump out everything that's not repeatable and subtle, then it's like, it's cause it's hard to show that subtle stuff, you know, it's like, it's, it's just really difficult to like, to prove, you can't prove it either. That's the funny thing about worldview is that in, once you're in the worldview, you, you can't, you know, if an angel appeared to you, you'd be like, it's a hallucination. It's a, it's, it's, you know, it's 3d projector or something. You know what I mean? It's absolutely impossible. You can't prove it, a worldview, you know? So it takes, um, it takes a leap. It's sort of like, how do you fall asleep? Right. You know, it mm-hmm. just happens, doesn't it? And that's the thing with the worldview stuff is it's like, so I think it's the first step though, is to be aware of the fact that, well, I have a worldview because people are like, no, there's reality. There's just reality. And they're like, no, that's a particular view of reality. You know, what your worldview is your reality. And, um, and then understand that there's alternatives and then starting to be, kind of be aware of it. And, and then taking that approach of, like I said, of, of, you know, just um, reserve judgment. You know, that might be true or might not be true. Let me see what happens. And, um, but I, I can tell you that, like I said, ultimately, atheist materialism is nihilism. And that's a horrible philosophy. That's a horrible worldview. Because that's just it's like, so everything's popular. <laughs> but it is, it's like, and you see that I'll watch movies and stuff. And I'm just like, God, at the same time, the alternative seems to be this fundamentalist Christianity that's so stupid. You know, it's just so mindless. And I'm like, why would I believe in this big white guy with a beard on a cloud who's going to zap my ass? I mean, that just seems ridiculous. And, um, you know, the rapture and all this crap, you know, and then they have all the, you know, there's just so many, there's, there's a lot of good stuff in Christianity. There really is. It has a very strong mystic tradition. There's incredible good stuff, but there's also lots of perversions of it. And, um, you know, that seems to be all alternative. But what's out there now is a true alternative to either one of those to atheist materialism and fundamentalist uh, religion, which is that you can have um, an understanding of reality. And a lot of it, like the Buddhist stuff is nice because, you know, karma, that seems, that makes sense to me. It's like, whatever you do comes back on you, right? It's not like you're being, mm-hmm. pun- it's like, if you stick your hand in the fire, you get burned. It's not because the fire is punishing you. It's just, that's what happens when you stick your hand in the fire. Right. And like what you did with the angry, you got really angry and used that power to get yourself the apartment. Well, then you had the consequences of it. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's just natural consequences of your actions. Right. That makes sense to me. That seems fair and just to me that whatever you do, you, you suffer, you either suffer the positive or reap the benefits of it. It seems very, very fair. And then the, also this Buddhist view of conscious, everything's consciousness, everything's awareness. Because everything you're experiencing, you don't experience the objective reality of anything. You just experience it in mind, right? I mean, there's no proof of the objective existence of anything. All that exists Mm -hmm. to you is mind, right? And so when you have a a whole philosophy that's built off that, and you've had people for thousands of, you know, thousand years or whatever, all these great people thinking, I mean, that's what's nice for me with the Buddhism is I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, modern people seem to have this arrogance of like, oh, I can just think it up myself. And so they have sort of sort of half-assed new age kind of thing. Whereas I'm like, hey, I can access this tradition. I've been initiated in it, you know, and I don't necessarily buy into every single piece of it, but there's a lot in it that's really meaningful to me. And really people have thought this through already. I can, I can, you know, it, it resonates with me. And that's why I like that. So the Buddhism I like a lot because of that. It's really the reality of, you know, that we are ultimately consciousness, you know, and that consciousness is ultimately united, you know, and the, the, the other weird thing you know, is that you, what we take to be the self doesn't really exist. It's, 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 it's an illusion. And that's really weird because that's really the more fundamental, even beyond worldview, there's a fundamental belief that I exist. There's an I, that there's a subject here that's seeing everything. And that's, that's an illusion as well. And so, um, and I've experienced that. I mean, that's what the whole non-dual, that's what the Kensho experience was, was to have that experience of, of still being conscious, but not having a self that's really weird. And so I think ultimately, as much as I like the astrology and everything like that, 
you know, what's, what, push, what, what I'm being pushed towards is to focus on, as particularly as I get older, because I'm, I can tell I'm, like, I'm getting weaker. I'm, you know, I get sick easier. I, you know, I just don't have the energy I used to. It's like, you know, I'm going to die. And so if my reality is that I'm this personal self body thing, I'm like, that's, that's really freaky, you know, but if, if my reality is, okay, I'm, that's not who I really am, you know, and, and I've had glimpses of it. I'm like, that's what I want to work towards. That's what enlightenment is, is the recognition of, of the true reality. And, um, and that's, what's great about all the stuff being available is that we can, we can get a benefit from it. We can do magic. We can do the prediction stuff, but also it points us in the direction of the spiritual path and spiritual progress and whatever that happens to be you know for everyone else there's a you know the the prophet muhammad says there's as many paths as there are human souls and that's correct what you want to do is find the path that resonates for you and i've been blessed to be able to find the one that does for me and i hope that everybody eventually everyone will that's the view you know every every sentient being will eventually become enlightened you know Mm -hmm. and then the cycle begins again you know that's just that's the that's the thing and that to me is very hopeful and that is a lot i like it a lot more than the nihilism and not, but, but more than that, nihilism is not true. It's not a very good model of reality. It just doesn't seem to me to be, you know, there's, it doesn't, there's so much joy and beauty, even though there is evil and pain that the nihilism just not, it's not true. That's not really how things are, but yeah, you know, evil I think is, the nihilism, yeah. um, it, it kind of is like the core of most of our problems <laughs> because it, it is like very mainstream in a weird way. Um, by now, you know, it's been developing over, it developed over mainly the past like 20th century or, you know, 19th century, but I don't think people are aware of it and, but it's there and it's really, no, um, I think you really have gotten what I liked about this, um, you know, interview is that you immediately jumped into worldview, which is so key. And then also you're really aware of the 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 modern worldview and the nihilism and that most people that i talk to they're like what what are you talking about no and i'm like no they're not seeing it and you're seeing it very clearly and i think you're correct is that it's really is problematic now that's not to say if you go back to middle you know middle ages that we didn't have all sorts of problems you know because even though Mm -hmm. they had this traditional view they still had greed and you know selfishness and all you know and anger and murder and all the sort of horrible stuff going on but as a society right it's kind of sad that people's natural instincts are thwarted by the official philosophy of the society, you know, because most people don't day to day don't really act nihilistically. I mean, there's a lot of love and beauty and, you know, friendship and all that stuff going on. It just doesn't make any sense philosophically, which most people don't care about. That's one of the reasons I like the traditional astrology is because I like traditional philosophy. I'm like, you know, I want to do, I want to know why I'm doing this. I want it to make sense. I don't want to just do stuff that's it's meaningless if I think about it. And that's the kind of trap you get into with modern stuff. So um, the book I use, it's a little bit heavy going, um, is a book called Elizabethan World Picture by Tilliard. And that's mm. the text I use for all my courses. A lot of people complain about it because they're like, oh, it's hard to read. And it is. But what it was was written as a way to explain Shakespeare, you know, to understand Shakespeare's plays, you need to understand the worldview. And it works really well for the, you know, the Renaissance astrology, though, too, because that's the same time period. So, and that's key. And um, just, it, but it's a bit like you plant a seed with it, and you plant the seed of the understanding of worldview, and you just keep coming back to it because you can't change your worldview instantaneously. You know, it's a very slow process. And, um, you know, or all of a sudden, I mean, sometimes you can have this sort of transformative experiences you know, and, 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 and suddenly become into a new reality. But normally it's a longer term process. But the first thing you do is that you sort of plant that seed and you it penetrate your consciousness and then it sort of like you keep coming back to it. So I hope that's, you know, like I said, this has really been, I've enjoyed this conversation today. And, yeah, um, thanks for going long. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was and I fun think that for me. You're, I think that you really have, you really keyed off of some really important stuff. And so I hope, you know, run with it because, you know, you've got some, these insights are really, the insights that you have are unusual. You know what I mean? Most people don't, <laughs> well, thank you. Most, most people don't get, you know, I'm mean, seriously, when I have this, when I mention this sort of stuff, most people don't get it. You immediately ran with it. And I end up having to, to really push the nihilist stuff or the worldview stuff. Whereas you are like, no, I got it. And you jumped all over it. So that's really great. Yeah. I, I think I'm more aware of it in 2020 than usual because <laughs> I'm finding my, like, it's so easy to, 
I mean, I use the language, it's kind of cliche, but I use the the red pill language and the blue Mm -hmm. pill language. Sure, sure, sure. And I think nihilism is the blue pill. And it's like throughout this year, I've just been like, okay, I'm not going to let the 2020 situation like throw me off. I got to stay centered. But it's so easy to just sort of like get really nihilistic and be like, yeah, whatever. Like there's nothing we can do. Get used to this shitty world. And I see people around me doing that, like getting deeper into the Netflix, deeper into alcohol and drugs or whatever, and just like giving up. And it's, it's like the norm to sort of be giving up right now. And so I'm sort of like, you know, trying to get the spiritual things as an alternative to just falling back and like blue pilling yourself with nihilism right now. Yeah, I guess and my my response has been sort of, in some ways sort of similar because I'm like I had to sh- I had to stop watching the news because I was mm-hmm. a very connected person. But what I've tried to do was to say the pain and the suffering of this is it's a bell going off. And every time that that, that I have that pain and suffering what I re- what I'm rec- what I have to recognize is that I'm not that I'm thinking that I exist <laughs> as a separate being. I'm not mm-hmm. knowing my true self. You know what I mean? I need to wake up. It's a wake up call. The pain and suffering, that's what it's there for, is a wake-up call. And it's like you're not seeing the true nature of reality. If you're suffering, you see yourself as separate. You see yourself as a self, you know, mm-hmm. and it's the Buddhist view. And it's like because the the one is is regardless of everything, you know, even even the pain is blissful to the one. You know what I mean? It's just the existence is just like that's it it um and we are one. Our consciousness, your consciousness, the aware part of you is the same as me. You know, there's no you and me. And so what I'm trying yeah. to do with 2020 is to, because because here's the problem for me. I have a very nice life. You know, I have this nice middle-class life and my little house and, you know, I have my wife and my studies that I can do and everything. And it's like, it's so easy to fall back into that and be like, just satisfied with the day-to-day stuff, which is fine, but it stops you from like making spiritual progress. You know, it stops me from, it seduces me from, you know, whereas the pain, that puts me right back on track. It's like, oh man, this is going to end, you know, and I need to wake up as fast as I can because, you know, this is not, this is not the, re- this is not the real reality, you know. And now if the other, the, as you said, you know, the, the pain and suffering of this year, you could easily try to, you know, and that's the thing, you could alcohol or internet or whatever, you can distract yourself from the pain. But it's like aspirin. It doesn't re- remove the problem. It doesn't go to the root, right? Whereas yeah. the root problem, the root problem is that we don't, we're not really understanding our true nature. Well, I you think know, that's, that's like the is. silver lining of this year. And yes. I'm, I'm noticing it with not only like my clients that I do readings for and stuff, but like there's just people that I'm hearing about their what's going on. And I see people are really acting um really erratically lately and doing kind of extreme things and um it's making me think well like everybody's having a really hard year and yes. everything <laughs> but like sometimes the like this year is going to bring up what was in on the back burner in people's personal problems and just shove it forward yes. and i'm seeing like i'm seeing people act really crazy and erratically or like you know in relationships, people like breaking up really bad breakups or really extreme fights and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, this is like a catalyst. Like these are problems that people have been avoiding for years. And now 2020 is like forcing them to change. So I think think that's true for the whole, everything for society, for everything. Is it's like, it's brought it all to a boil, you know? And, and, and at this point it's like, then you get to see your true quality, right? You see what people's true nature is, you know, at least in the whatever predominant quality is, because it's like, if you're, you know, if you're going to freak, you'll freak, you know, there's certainly been a lot of freaking craziness going on, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, yeah, so very, these are all really good insights. And, um, you know, I think that um, it's nice for me because, you know, and it's funny because me with COVID, I'm like very isolated anyway. It has hardly had any effect on me Mm -hmm. because I never go out anyway. You know, this is like, I'm just all my stuff, all my interactions that are internet anyway. I mean, I, I, I don't even drive, you know, I, I probably didn't get in a car more than once a month, you know? And so I have this really weird existence. And so, but nevertheless, 
it's been really difficult year for, you know, for everybody. And my wife said that to Maria Lyon. I said, you know, no matter, we don't know what's going to happen. We're all going to have the COVID experience in the entire world. It's a global thing. Mm-hmm. Nobody has escaped the effects of it. And, um, you know, so I think that there's, you know, you, you got to acknowledge the pain and suffering. You can't diminish that. It's really been awful in many ways, but just like you said, that there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a silver line. This. And it's true of pain in general. You know, there's a, it's not meaningless. It's purposeful. And, and that's the thing about nice about once you have a sense of spiritual sense of reality, then because it's meat, life is meaningful then you can, you can handle so much more, you mm-hmm. know, you understand what this is about and why it's happening and it's, you can handle it a lot better. And, um, you know, if, if things are meaningless though, it's freaky, that's really freaky and scary, you know, but it's like, this is for a purpose. So like, okay, all right, I can handle this if it's necessary to do that. And, and also my life has meaning. My life has purpose. That mm-hmm. is what else is there, you know? And what I find really that, day in, day out, what I really love to do is I like to serve, you know, and, and that's a lot of the legal stuff I do is constantly people calling me up and I can't always give them what they want, but I can try to tell them the truth about their situation. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. what I try to do for them. It's just when people, cause I can't take their case necessarily, but when people call me, I'll say, okay, I can talk to you for 15 or 20 minutes. Let me try to do, let me try to give you the benefit of what I think about the situation. And, um, you know, the service, you know, that's really what it's, it's what it's all about. And um, I hopefully do that with the astrology as well. You know, when I do a reading for somebody or a talismans or whatever, it's all in service. And um, so again, I'm, I'm gonna have to roll, but yeah. I very much enjoyed, this is great talking to you. And, um, you know, you, um, you have some great perceptions, you have some great instincts. So go with, you know, go with those. Yeah, thanks a lot, and and thanks for all the work you do. Like, I mean, <laughs> I've at least known the Orphic Hymns for the past <laughs> six years because of your website popping up on Google. Um, but before you leave, if you could just um, tell our listeners how they can learn more about your work. Yeah, I mean, the best thing to do would be go to RenaissanceAstrology.com, and at the top there, there's a you know there's a menu bar, and you've got um, uh, readings, courses talismans. Um, and that's, you know, good as far as products and services. And then, you know, there's just, I mean, the, the website has like 800 pages on it. There's an incredible amount of information. There's translations. There's all sorts of information about like planetary hours, mansion of the moon, all the different stuff. And you can learn through that. So you can kind of engage at whatever level that you want to engage at. So awesome to be here. And I really look forward to uh, talking to you again. Thanks for listening to my interview with Christopher Warnock. Um, That was a great time. And like I said in the beginning, I've been going on his website, honestly, maybe since like college or high school. I always recognized it and always thought it was a great resource. And it, 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 it took me a while to put like two and two together that, you know, he created the website. He translated the Picatrix and all that and really had a big impact on what we may take for granted in today's astrological canon of texts and information. So after the fact, I'm even more honored that he came on the show and even happier with how the conversation went. Um, so thanks to Christopher for coming on the show. Um, yeah, get ready for this big week we have ahead of us, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, and I actually misspoke about uh, my chart placements, and my sun and moon are actually at nine degrees of, uh, my, my sun is at nine degrees of Leo, and 
uh, moon is at nine degrees of Scorpio. So yeah, this full moon is going to be hitting me even more than I originally thought. Um, so I'm going to continue to try to give anecdotes, uh, about how this astrology affects me because talking about your own chart sometimes is a great way to teach all of it. But besides that, um, I mentioned earlier that I can't get a hold of a Llewellyn calendar to do my forecast and I am trying to get solar fire for myself. I did create a GoFundMe to raise money to purchase that. Uh, I'll include the link in the show notes. I announced that last week during last week's episode, but um, I would like to add that if you would like to donate to that GoFundMe, um, if you donate, um, you know, thirty dollars for a thirty, you basically if you donate thirty dollars to the GoFundMe, I will give you a thirty-minute astrology reading. If you do, if you donate sixty dollars to the GoFundMe, I'll give you a sixty-minute astrology reading. So basically, if you want to book a reading. Do it directly to that GoFundMe. I'm just trying to keep all the money in one place. I really want solar fire so that I don't need the damn Llewellyn calendar whose artwork I loathe, who I really despise the the artwork that that they include. I'm sorry to whoever created it, but I've just never liked... I've never liked the artwork on the Llewellyn calendars for astrology. Um, And also, I want to create a cosmic keys wall calendar for 2022. And to do that, I'm going to need solar fire y'all. I'm not going to do that by hand. I'm sorry. So yeah, to support my solar fire purchase, check out the link that's in the show notes. Um, to get full episode extensions of the show, you can go to patreoncom slash cosmic keys. This episode in particular went long And the patrons did get some nice, juicy, extra content. So if you like extra content, if you like unedited conversations, check that out too. I am constantly considering ways to improve the Patreon. I know I've hinted at it before. Um, I'm thinking about making a separate feed that is strictly weekly astrology forecasts. Um, that are really thorough and in-depth and maybe some extra stuff like that um, for the $5 tier of the Patreon. But that's still a maybe. But either way, if you want extra content, if you want to support me, check out the Patreon. Uh, Check out my social media pages. Um, Instagram is at Cosmic underscore Keys underscore podcast. Twitter at Cosmic Keys 777. And other than that, um, enjoy this pretty active week in the in the heavens and if you are fixed like me with fixed placements buckle up y'all it's going to be more uranian energy more full moon activation so i'm going to try to i'm going to try to just roll through i got like a 10 day vacation kind of and even like even having just a couple even just having these days off lets me put more focus on this show right now. And it's making me realize I need to like have more free time for these projects. So I'm going to try to take full advantage of this week and fight through my, my um, lingering COVID symptoms. So thank you all for listening. Really appreciate all the listener support and listenership in general. And other than that, have a wonderful week, and I'll talk to everybody next week. Take care.